All right, great. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Grand Rounds event today. Whether you're joining us in the Ringos Auditorium or somewhere else virtually, we thank you for taking time to attend this special presentation. As a reminder for those that are virtual, there is not a separate link for the meet and greet today. The meet and greet will be integrated into the lecture at the end. If you would like to ask our speaker a question, please type it into the Q&A. If you would like to engage with the presenter, ask the webinar host to unmute you or give you access to turn on your camera. If you are attending in person and would like to engage, just raise your hand and we will bring you a mic. We also have posted the QR code for today's mock two quiz on the back, uh, on the back desk by the door uh, for those of you who are attending in person. I think it's right there. Uh, we are honored to have Dr. Yatin Vyas speak with us on the roles of WASP protein in optimizing children's healthcare in 2023. Dr. Yatin Vyas is a professor and chair of the Department of Pediatrics, Children's Miracle Network, and Four Diamonds Endowed Chair. He has been with Penn State Health Children's Hospital since November 2021. Since beginning with Penn State Children's Hospital, Dr. Vyas has spearheaded a number of initiatives most notably movement towards the creation of a children's care service line. He's also done a number of media appearances highlighting the important work that the Children's Miracle Network and Four Diamonds Fund completes. Prior to joining Penn State Health, Dr. Vias was Mary Joy and Jerry Stead, Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Iowa and led the Division of Hematology Oncology since June 2013 as Division Director. He has also previously served as a faculty member in the Department of Pediatrics, Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. He holds certificates in leadership development for physicians and academic health centers from the Harvard School of Public Health and the University of Pittsburgh Katz School of Business. He recently graduated as a scholar in the Association of Medical School Pediatric Department Chairs Physician Leadership Development Program. Dr. Fias' research is focused on defining the molecular cause and subsequent development of Wiscott Aldrich syndrome an inborn error of immunity. Research from his laboratory was essential in revealing for the first time an evolutionarily conserved novel chromatin resonant role for WASP protein in gene transcription, genome stability, and oncogenesis. His research has been nearly continuously funded by the NIH since 2002, having received multiple R01s and R21 awards as principal investigator, in addition to awards from the American Society of Hematology and the United States Immunodeficiency Network. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Vyas. Thank you so much. This is, oh, okay, I can do that. Terrific, excellent, yeah. Thank you, Lee. This is so kind of you to, to introduce me the way you did. And it truly is a great, great pleasure for me to come here. I've sat there for eight years. I've been here a number of different times and it's just like being coming back home. So it's uh, terrific, so thank you. So what I'm gonna do today is to really uh, take you through the journey, a journey not only of science, you know, as a scientist, we learn a number of aspects in, in cell biological and molecular biology uh, of a particular cell, but I wanna sort of uh, try to extract out some of the paradigms I observed uh, throughout my time in science and see how they relate to building clinical networks and how those paradigms can be co-opted and scalable. But importantly is during the COVID times, as I was sort of thinking about what else to do at home, I took to Cosmos and started understanding the astrophysics of it. And then I realized, goodness me, there's such a similarity that exists, the unity of mechanisms that exists between the cosmological phenomena, the cellular phenomena, and how to, and, and, and there might be some clues uh, uh, to how, how to build uh, the next children's care enterprise. So I think hopefully you will see how the whole, whole thing is intertwined. And, and for that reason, I've used the alliteration CCC, Cell Clinic Cosmos, you know, decoding the unifying paradigms. So let's see, uh, I'm trying to get to the next slide. Okay, it's here. Okay, so before I take you through this, I just wanna see the, show you the institution that I sort of, uh, landed about 13 months ago. It's Penn State Health uh, Academic Community Health Systems in the central PA region right here. We are about a $4 billion uh, health enterprise since we don't have a insurance company just like UPMC has a health plan. So that's another. So just to give you a context, uh, UPMC is 12 billion healthcare and 12 billion in, 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 uh, in the insurance. So it's 24 billion. So it's a little tiny 
uh, spec compared to that. Uh, but these are the different institutions we have, the Penn State Health Family, you have the major uh, flagship hospital, the, the Hershey Medical Center, we have the Children's Hospital, which is shown right here. It's its, its own building connected to the entire health system there. Uh, we have many other sort of uh, health uh, medical centers, uh, hospitals that we purchased, I want to say in the last few years. And what was very exciting at the time I was joining, uh, there was this, uh, this is a particular place where they used to have a Toys R Us building in, in somewhere near the Lancaster region, if you know the topology of that area. And that's now, that's where it stands in the brand new ambulatory care, pediatric uh, ambulatory care uh, uh, clinic. It's not a, it's, it's, it's probably a day hospital, but not really overnight. And number of other joint ventures we have, number of institutes we have, and, 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 and really spruned all over central PA. We have, uh, you know, close to hundred now outpatient locations that we sort of uh, look into uh, for providing care to our children there. A uh, little bit about our department. Uh, we have about 20 divisions as shown here. What is very, very, very interesting is that uh, I have a division of cardiac surgery, pediatric cardiac surgery under pediatrics as opposed to being surgery. That brings a unique uh, opportunities for us to build an outstanding cardiac uh, program. Um, and, and this is the research connectivity as you see here around the world. I mean, the faculty in the department of pediatrics are team players and they work around um, uh, work with a number of investigators around the world. As you can see here, this is our fingerprint. And by the Blue Ridge, we are somewhere in the 44, just to give you a context, Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh is 22, so ways to go uh, to catch up, uh, uh, but things are going the right direction. We're currently 5.7, 5.8 million from four. So all good stuff. So what are the learning objectives for today? And, and I just want us to start thinking about uh, the following. We have to start rethinking the strategy for children's hospital in the wake of COVID pandemic. Obviously, that is intuitive for us, and I'll give you some of the some of the rationale for it. But I also want to sort of tie this with rethinking WASP role. As uh, uh, as you know, I work on whisker dollar syndrome protein, and and how we started rethinking WASP role in oncogenesis in wake of its recent move to the nucleus. It was never in the nucleus; it was always in the cytoplasm. And I'll give you some stories about that. And as I said, you know, since uh, in the wake of James Webb Space Telescope, for those of you who are following Cosmos, uh, I mean, we have to start rethinking Cosmos. And I'll show you some of the paradigms that unite all of us. So my hope is that uh, you can appreciate at the end of the talk the profound connectivity between the cell clinic and the Cosmos. So with that, uh, let's see. So children's healthcare, and this is so critical for us in PEDS, right, as we are sort of uh, uh, staring at the new year. Um, what is our overall objective as a healthcare enterprise? You know, it's really, we want to provide quality care, we want to really be very cognizant of the cost. And above all, I think in academic pediatrics, as in any academic health system, market differentiation and strategic differentiation uh, in that context is key. And this is how we are going to really call ourselves an outstanding healthcare system, isn't it? And the model that we have used to achieve this objective is the legacy model, the traditional full service hospital model that if you build it, they shall come. So you build this big hospital system and then we expect everybody to come to us. And that's the legacy system. And I'll sort of review with you what are the issues with that. We all as children's hospitals have enjoyed, a freestanding children's hospital enjoyed a high Fitch ranking, which is sort of ranks us based on how well we are doing financially and our borrowing capacity and such. And that is consequent to a number of different uh, inputs. And those are, we, we have a unique market position, obviously. <coughs> Excuse me. We have specialized clinical services, as you know, we have very strong philanthropy, we can attract, children's always does that. And by and large, we have a strong operating margin. I would say that's going to be, this is really at risk right now. But typically that's the reason why we've done quite well. But if you look at the situation as it stands right now, uh, the current reality, again, using the 4C challenge, the complexity as pediatrician, you all know that we really deal with uh, really high clinical complexity, not only in wake of personalized and precision medicine that is assured in the complexity of taking care of our children. And then the important thing is the candidness, how transparent we are to our community, the quality and the price points that we talk about in providing this kind of complex care 
And all this has to be sort of thought uh, under the rubric of competition. Yeah, we have a growing competition. Uh, I know you, the UPMC captures 90% of the market here, but look, you know, if you're in the region where I am, where you have Chop and Geisinger and Hopkins and UPMC also coming in that direction, I think competition is quite fierce. And, and mind you, the cost of providing this kind of care is skyrocketing. So that's not only just because the cost is up, the reimbursements are down. And some of you may also be following the recent cuts in the Medicaid dish, which is basically disproportionate to share hospitals. And so the bottom line is that really our business is at risk right now. Uh, and so we as pediatricians have to sort of think about it. Compounding this steady state realities is, is the peri-COVID reality, as you know. Children's hospitals have lost about 40% of the revenue, about $2 billion per month in 2020. And this was reported to the HHS. And what this has done really is to, you know, patients, as you know, have deferred care and, and they have deferred care, which has caused high acuity now. The ED visits, ED is inundated, you've experienced it, everybody experiences it now in the country. And there has been this almost uh, epidemic that is almost crawling under the epidemic of COVID called the mental behavioral illnesses. The lowest birth rate we have uh, reported children now comprise only about 20, 25% of our population, which is a record low since we start keeping these records. And, and think about this in the context of the NICU bassinets that uh, are now at a record high, right? Because this is, uh, this, is, this is one mechanism for most hospitals to make quick money. But there's 240% increase in since 1985 compared these two. It's just not sustainable in that sort of context. And the competition for therefore patients is really fierce. So what we have to do is this is this real conflict that all pediatricians, us sitting in this room and on, on the Zoom call are facing. What is our mission? Our mission is what is best for our kids. Oftentimes what is best for our kids is really not best for the hospitals, right? For the bottom line. And so we have to be good stewards of it. How do we protect this asset, which is the care delivery system? And we all are going through turbulent financial headwinds, sudden leadership changes that you must have noted. We note around the country, we see this. And above all, there's a shifting market landscape. And so, so when we come to that, we always ask this question, you know, and Charles Darwin sort of said it so eloquently, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, right? It is one that is the most adaptable to change. And, and sometimes we can say, despite knowing that, that look, you know, our profits are going down and all that sales are down and yet, you know, something magical will happen. Honestly, nothing magical ever happens. And, and Albert Einstein said this so well, that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So we really need to have some rethink the strategy. What do we need to do to get to where we need to go in, in, in the next 10 years? So with that, you know, I think as we were talking about rethinking strategy, I, I wanna uh, come back to my time when I started here. And I moved from New York City to Sloan Kettering. I spent about 10 years and then I came here and I wanted to start challenging the prevailing paradigm in risk adult syndrome. As I said, it was predominantly a cytoplasmic protein. So let's take you through that a little bit and see how rethinking strategy here helped us. Well, for those of you who are not very familiar, so WASP is an excellent inborn error of immunity. I really, really think is math is nature's masterful genetic experiment, and I'll show you why. Because some of the fundamental concepts are more broadly applicable to clinical medicine, despite being an orphan, almost like an orphan disease or a rare disease by NIH, you know, there's so much to learn from this particular uh, uh, disease. So clinically, you know, most of you know this, it's, it's sort of presence in the neonatal period or early infancy is petechiae, as seen over here, uh, really nagging dermatitis, uh, eczema all over, uh, atopy and combine immunodeficiency and dysregulation resulting in systemic infections and so on and so forth. But of the kids who end up surviving this and modern, med modern medicine has allowed us to do all that stuff, uh, the large majority, I'm gonna say about 70% or two thirds of these patients will go on to develop autoimmune disorders, organ specific autoimmune disorders. And of these patients who develop autoimmune disorders, uh, uh, vast majority may will have some form of cancer. Here I show lympho lymphomas in the ileocecal region as a classical uh, cancer, but variety of other hematologic malignancies. A bit about the cell biology, WAS gene encodes for a protein that goes exactly by the same name, viscodology syndrome protein, WAS protein. Its function is 
when the gene was identified in the, I want to say in the mid 90s, clone, uh, its function really is to form this cortical cytoskeleton or the actin cytoskeleton as it's known. So here is the wasp protein uh, with a domain called the VCA domain that it uh, associates with the actin related protein ARP23. This is ARP2 and ARP3 and starts sort of nucleating this actin from a G actin. That's a single actin, monomeric actin shown here. But then it forms this sort of filaments and this Y-shaped dendritic nucleation, which is very typical of wasp proteins as opposed to this you know, long filamentous actin. So that's a distinction. So this is what it does. And this is what gives the tensile strength to the cell and the cortex and so on and so forth. And so for the longest time at that point in time, the dominant hypothesis was very cytosol centric because the protein was found in the cytosol. And, and it, was, it was believed and thought for the longest time, and it still is true to an extent, the defects of the cytosolic actin polymerization causes the human disease. And this is just a cell showing red color, it's just actin staining. So this is where actin is predominantly as it was shown earlier. So this is the time when I assure in, uh, I come into this, or our laboratory comes in, and one of some of the weaknesses we observe is that, you know, WASG gene, there are a number of about 300 mutations, but there are certain mutations that give you severe actin defect, but give you really, really mild disease. So no cancer at all. But then there are certain mutations that give you no actin defect, which is shown here. And there are about 20, 30% of those, of the 300 mutations, but those ones give you severe disease and cancer. So look, look, this is just a, um, um, confusing and puzzling observation. And, and then we looked at some of the WASP patient samples that were coming to us from Sloan Kettering at that time that I brought with me. When you look at those uh, samples on the microscope, the cortical actin was normal. And yet they had apoptosis, senescence, and those patients went on to develop cancer. So obviously there was something not uh, matching. And these observations in my mind in a laboratory challenged the cytoplasmic centric actin hypothesis, as I had alluded to here, right? Um, but remember, you have to challenge the prevailing paradigm, because now how do we go from cytoplasm to somewhere else? So let's see. Uh, so this is, if there's one thing we want, I would like to convey to everybody in the field, the trainees of us that always have the courage not to conform. And we do not want to create, you know, recreate the exact same renditions of the, of, of the, of the, of the, of the uh, prior concepts, but have this courage. And our laboratory at that time was looking into, okay, now let's see, let's see if I can go forward. What did it say? Okay. And I went back to space. So if you look at the Hubble telescope many years ago, there was this absolutely dim region in space. And that dim region has, there was nothingness and emptiness. And they decided to peer into the, the deep, deep, deep recesses of the space for days on end, expecting really nothing because all the light was somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. And guess what? When they did that for days on end, they found this particular star. This means uh, morning star or first light here in Dale that actually twinkled about 12.9 billion years ago, which is just about 900 million shy of the Big Bang, which is 13.7 or 13.8 billion years ago. And this is a star has got red shifted because as cosmic inflation is occurring, the light wave, you know, the, uh, it gets significantly stretched the wavelength. And so as you go, we get into the red and infrared region, which is why you found that. So the dim region of space gave you some ideas. And this is what it said, aha. Uh -huh. And for that reason, we looked at, this is actually, by the way, in my days, we could take my own dendritic cell and my own T cells. So this is my DC, my T cells, they're interacting with each other. And we stained it with Wiscardal descendant protein and DAPI is the nucleus. And as you can see, there are some DAPI bright regions and there are DAPI dim regions. You see those DAPI dim regions. Let me see if I can. Uh, you see this, there are DAPI dim regions here and there are DAPI bright regions. And and what you see is not projecting very well is there is a wasp in this dim regions in the nucleus. And we thought initially it was an artifact. So we did it hundreds of times and it wasn't an artifact. Much like the dim, dim regions here, we were able to find wasp sitting inside the nucleus in, in some uh, quantity. 
So, so we, we had a conundrum at that time because NIH grants that was first R1 that was submitted from here was only talking about the bright regions and the ones that are present in the cytoplasm. And it got funded at a stellar score. And then when I made this observation, I said, I don't want to pursue the cytoplasmic. So I wrote to the NIH and said, look, we have made some provocative observation that WASP is in the nucleus. Maybe we can pursue that. So the other thing that is so intriguing is why pursue the dim regions? We were asked this question, well, it could be an artifact. There's another thing I want to show before I go into the data. This is the star, which is about 1,200 light years away. It's interestingly, it's called WASP. Uh, and I didn't make it up. It's a web telescope said that. And there, is a, and there is a planet that actually is revolving around it. And the way they, they were able to identify this is that as the planet sort of traverses in front of the star, the light, starlight dims, as you can see. And anytime it dims, you know there is a planet sort of crossing it. And that's how an exoplanet was discovered. So see the value in going after darkness, you know, or something that is dim and something that is not so obvious in, in your face. And so the other thing that was very, very intriguing is that when James Webb made this telescope, they were also able to sample the, the atmosphere. And the, the, when they sample the atmosphere, there is water in the atmosphere. So is there life? It's a very provocative observation there, right? So if you look at dim regions, you know, this is, uh, this is the sum total of number of years of work, which was actually featured on the science translation medicine work that came up from here. And one of the authors is sitting here. Um, and, uh, and, and so what we found is that you see, this is, a, this is a T cell, this is a nucleolus, and this is the blue is nucleus. There's a lot of lumpy, bumpy nuclear staining for wasp that is present. It's also in the cytoplasm. And so we were able to identify wasp where wasp was not. And so what did we identify? So you can see this right here, it's in the dim regions. So I also wanna convey this very, very important sort of thing that I learned. Truth may be farther from where the light is the brightest. Go after uh, the thing. So in a nutshell, I'll show you, this is wasp. Uh, and wasp, which is shown here, and the wasp actually, let's see, the, okay, goes into the, goes, goes to the cell surface. As you know, this was a classical binds to lots of proteins. And this is where it causes actin polymerization. Our work showed that wasp, the portion of it goes into the nucleus to the nuclear pore complex, which is right here and goes there, binds to another set of uh, proteins and associates with a number of different cis regions on the, on, the, on, on, on the DNA. And so this was quite a provocative observation, which finally got published uh, in that particular journal. And, and what we found is that if you were to isolate and purify this complex, you have sort of this weighted mass spec and we showed that you know, it has actin, which is what its legacy function truly is and some of, the, some of the transport proteins. But what we were really struck by was the fact that when you actually purify this complex, you not only find actin, but you find a number of different very important complexes come down with it, such as the one that I talk about here, chromatin modifiers, RNA metabolism, DNA repair, and replication. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So, so the, the bottom line is that the nuclear and cytosolic WASP complexes are not only com compositionally, but also functionally very distinct. And, and this was the outcome of having courage not to conform. So in the 12, 13 years of work, I will summarize in one cartoon slide here now for you. So I just wanna be sure that it is not too dense, but just understand. Remember, we're talking about wasps. So the function we found it opens up the packed chromatin and you know how chromatin is completely packed in some regions, heterochromatin around the promoter opens up the promoter chromatin and allows access to a lot of uh, transcription complexes. That was one of the functions we identified. The other function, and, and, and I won't get through in, in great detail, except to say that this is another paper we published again from Pittsburgh in blood. And, uh, and it showed that it functions, it does so by really working with a complex called the MLL complex and really working on the H3K4 ME3, which is a post-translation modification of histone tail that enables um, opening up the chromatin such that it allows complexes such as the chromatin modeling complexes of the Swiss sniff family to come in at, uh, okay, so, okay, here. And so that's one thing. So then, then we went on to show that it has another very interesting function. This work came about in Iowa when I moved out and we found that once it does make an RNA, as you know, the exon intron 
uh, mm, uh, transcript is created from the DNA translational axis. And then, you know, it's really important to start splicing it out so that we have a mature RNA. And has this, it really takes an attendance in some ways. We found that WASP has a role in taking this attendance and asking where is it, who's here, who's there, and is there an exon, intron, exon, intron, and, and goes and, and actually signals to SRSF2. And this is not our work. This is also published in one of the nature journals recently, I want to say about a few weeks or a month ago, uh, which was consequent to our first work that was published about two years ago showing that it's, it's involved in RNA processing. So it's fundamental role in RNA processing. <clears throat> and then we went on to show something very, very provocative. So what are RLIBs? So what happens is when an RNA pol 2 is moving along, it opens up a DNA axis. As you know, it's a, a duplex structure. So this is your one single-stranded DNA. This is one DNA and the RNA comes out. And RNA normally does not bind back to the DNA. That does not occur. If it occurs, it's evanescent, transient, and it's controlled. The process is exceptionally well controlled because this formation of a RNA-DNA hybrid with a single-stranded DNA is called r -loops. And that could be catastrophic to the cell, that you don't want r -loops to be present for a long period of time. Now, not all r -loops are bad. There are good r -loops too. We won't get there. So classically, DNA is a double uh, helical structure. It's always uh, uh, double. RNA is always single. So, you know, look, this was millions of years ago. This would be microaggression right now to ask somebody if you're single or not, you see. But this, this particular sort of structure, we identified that WASP has a big role in, in preventing RLA formation, the bad RLA formation by way of modulating the function of topoisomerase one, which actually prevents or unwinds the, uh, and rewinds back the, the, uh, the, the DNA structure. And otherwise it sort of functions to prevent that. And RNA is H is a ribonuclease H1 that chews any RNA that is bound to DNA. It does not touch any single stranded RNA. So if you are in the context of in a promiscuous relationship, RNA DNA, then it goes and chews up that, it prevents that. We found a fundamental role of WASP in this, and we're very excited that uh, uh, that was uh, nicely tied in with this particular role. Uh, and the, finally, the paper that recently got published in Nature Communication was this particular paper. And this is very intriguing. So we were actually looking at how does this sort of function occur so that, you know, what we found is that if this is a single standard DNA, as I mentioned, the single standard DNA has to be covered. If it's not covered, it is susceptible to be chewed by some exonucleases and that causes significant instability and in cancer formation. So, so we said, what is the one, what is a protein? So it was always known that there's a protein called RPA. So this is replication protein A. Let's see if I can show you uh, right here. So replication protein A actually covers the single stranded DNA. But if there is too little of it, as it's shown in here, um, okay, or if it's too, too much of that, both of those things are not good. So too much of covering or too little covering of SSDNA can cause genomic instability. And what we found was very provocative that WASP is involved in modulating how much RPA goes to the single-stranded DNA. And, and as we were uh, trying to understand that, obviously they were so provocative, got accepted, got published a few months ago. Then we went on to identify a mechanism. And the mechanism... So this, this paper is also under review right now, second review, and hopefully it should get accepted in a few months. So what we found is that RPA binds to G-actin. So which we remember the G-actin. And so this is how sort of it remains sort of leaves, un, prevents being unleashed to, to, to the areas of DNA. But what, what, what this does, and this is a work that we did in collaboration with two investigators, one in UK, another in Spain, and what it shows is that WASP actually drives affectin, as you remember, you know, it causes from G actin to affectin. And when it does so, it, it releases the RPA. And it releases the RPA in such a way that it then forms a nice complex. And this is just some of the data to show that if you, you inhibit RP3 because WASP acts through RP3 to give you actin, then everything goes back in this direction. So if you look at the bottom one, RPA is not forming any of these kinds of dots as it should under HU. So it seems that RPA is really uh, uh, kept in check with the G-actin because you inhibited it. Another way to show it is that we had another, uh, uh, a nice mutant uh, of actin. This is a mutant of actin that is 
spontaneously depolymerizes and there's a mutant of actin that spontaneously hyperpolymerizes. It's too much of F actin or too little. And you can pretty much sort of recapitulate this data showing that if you're too much of G actin, you don't have RPA going to where it's supposed to go. But if you have too, too, too little of G actin, there's a lot of that going into the system. So I think we have found a very good mechanism. Uh, we are hoping that this paper will also be accepted in a high impact journal. Uh, the bottom line is that WASP actin polymerization activity functions to deliver a pool of RPA at the right time, which is at the replication stress time, and at the right place, which is stressed RFs. Okay, so the work was published in all these different, I need to acknowledge those folks where either this is just the last eight papers on the, on the work I just showed you, number of uh, fortunate and uh, thankful to the NIH, a number of uh, NIH grants. Uh, these are my two stars, uh, assistant professors in the laboratory, Song Su Han and Hua Kwan Wen, who have really spearheaded much of this work in the, in the last uh, seven, eight years. But what is really very um, satisfying is that this work was reproduced in multiple different other cell lineages, organisms, and, and also extended to a number of different wasp family proteins by others, uh, almost a dozen paper. And that is always of value. You remember, courage not to conform. That is so key, but that doesn't, it comes to the price because, you know, if you're trying to sell anything that is nuclear this day and age, you're going to have the truculence of your colleagues, uh, you know, descend on you. So it's very important to rethink your strategy. So coming back to rethinking your strategy and reimagining the future, especially during a crisis, you know, so what do we do? I want to sort of bring this sort of uh, slide. This is a very, very important slide, I believe. But if you remember the 2008 time when there was a significant financial downturn, uh, not only did uh, the, the, in, in the companies that actually innovated during that time through a crisis, they outperformed their peers and you could see how they outperformed it. Even after the recovery phase, they were better at 10% during crisis, but even after crisis, they were sort of continually outperforming. And there, if you look at their ethos, the overarching ethos for these companies is day zero. And this is what I think is very important is pediatricians to understand. Well, day zero meaning if, if a company starts, a Wall Street company starts, you cannot increase its uh, value by rebuying or buybacking or buyback shares. It really has to innovate, invent some, some ways to do it. We all have to do this. We all have to think of our time as day zero. We are going to start fresh today, no matter how much success you have. And I think that one particular company that you all know uh, really illustrate this quite uh, vividly is, is Microsoft. And so when Bill Gates was the CEO and this other duration, this time span, there's a little, you know, tiny bit of uh, up uh, uh, value to the shareholder value. And then Steve came after that, it's not that bad. But really what Satya did, uh, Modella, uh, is really he took this uh, to a completely different level. And the idea is that, you know, he created this mindset that switched your mindset from know it all to learn it all. And I think this is so critical for us and for, for some of our young physicians and physician scientists who are embarking on a career right now to have these kind of day zero ethos, but also understand that this is, this is something critically important for us. So what do we learn uh, that is state of art today? And, and in, but most importantly, what, what is the state of art tomorrow or 10 years from now? That is going to be key. So now I have just pointed out some of the questions I think as pediatricians we have to think about. Like how do we optimize evidence-based practice and as you know, as we sort of grow into our communities and away from the motherships of children's hospital legacy models, we will have to start thinking about evidence-based practices across the entire continuum of scientific, academic and community pediatric practices. We will have to adapt to new innovations and you all know those new innovations, whether it's digital or AI into a clinical care. How do we do this? And this is something that is critical? How do we achieve the best possible outcomes? Now, I'm not talking about the length of stay or adjusted length of stays or ED revisits, none of that. And those are important. I'm talking about the real, real, real outcome. How fast do you put your children back into the community, into the schools? And so what kind of outcome we can provide them? And the important thing is the preventive pediatrics at the population level. We all know that reduces costs, but really we have not invested in this. We need to do this. The time is now, right now. And the final thing that is very novel to many of us is the value-based care. We always so fixated on volume, 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 RVU, activity, but we really not started thinking about value. 
And the payers are now started thinking about value. How do we provide value in our care to our children? And, and value means a number of different things. And I, I highlight a few, uh, quality, patient satisfaction, innovative offerings, and importantly, how lean can you be in this particular context? Three things I always remind myself as we embark on any program or a project, I ask all my division chiefs to ask, what is the mission for what you wanna do? What is the market for what program you are trying to build? And, and provide me the business plan so that I know what the margin is. So if you cannot answer the question in three Ms, I think you'll never sort of get any project off the ground. So we have to keep rethinking clinical strategy. The strategy has to really inform the structure, not the other way around. We try to create very elaborate structures, governance structures. We try to retrofit it into a strategy that is a recipe for disaster. And, and so when I went to Iowa, not Iowa, to, to, to Penn State, I, I said, that let's pose some of the questions. And these are the questions that are topically went to for any health systems. Do we have a sustainable base of patients? And so how do you answer that? You say, okay, you quantify that by asking, do we have significant number of captured pediatric lives? As I was told yesterday, 90% of the lives you, you, you control here, which is excellent. We too in that region, but we have a much smaller region. Uh, do you have limited out migration for the tertiary and quaternary care? And I would say, yeah. And do you have the full complement of those specialties? And I would, I would argue that the vast majority of the children's hospital, the academic children's hospital, the answer is yes, you really tick all the three boxes. But if you do tick all the three boxes, the follow-up question should be the following. Are we a premium valued children's enterprise? Are we? And there are different ways to sort of address that. And I've sort of highlighted five ways. Are we a high volume growth enterprise? Mind you, not all volume is good volume because volume and margin go hand in hand. And if you're looking at CMI, again, this is inpatient-based metric. So you're looking at a volume that has a favorable CMI, case mix index, if you're not familiar too much with it. Then the patient experience is critical. Are we in the top decide? It could be any of those. You, know, you could have the vision criteria, the press gainy, or what have you you're using. I think as pediatrician, we have to remain uh, fully focused on, on patient experience. And this is very important, outpatient access. You could have the most outstanding tertiary quaternary care enterprise, but you don't, if you disallow patients to come and use it, your access is less than, uh, it may not be less than 72 hours. It could be a week, it could be two weeks, it could be four weeks, uh, or your ED flow is completely inundated, it's clogged, they don't have fast tracks, you don't have mechanisms to really take your patients. You don't have mechanisms to put them in based on their acuity uh, whether it's urgent care, walk-in, what have you, you have to create a network. And the final thing is that do you have high quality and safety marks, like the vision benchmarks. We talk about the five different uh, categories that we all sort of remain fixated on. And what are those? And how do we sort of create the very best care? And I would, I would argue here, and I hope you'll agree that the answer is no for most academic children's hospital right now. We cannot, we don't have, uh, we have not achieved any of these things, or we have achieved a few of those things. If that is the case, we would rethink strategy. And healthcare industry or any industry that has excess supply or fierce competition or low profit margin as ours, um, an article in HBR says that you have to reshape industry boundaries. And how do you reshape industry boundaries? And I propose that the way to do is to really create what is called a service line. I'll take you a little bit into a service line. So what is a service line for us? So service line is the traditional service line, if you look at it, uh, it is based on the assumption of the model that we can be all things for all people, right? And hence a disease focused approach is required for us to provide that care. Right? And that, that is intuitive, that is smart. So the whole, the, the predominant service lines are the cardiology or the HVI, we call that, neurology, orthopedics, cancer, and so on. In, in that particular instance, if you see these service lines are created on the model, there's one disease that is serving multiple populations, correct? It could be the vast number of patients going into the cardiology or cancer and so on and so forth. So what I am sort of saying that this is a very provider-centric approach or a disease-centric approach to doing it. And if you look at the one that, uh, what, what we say children's care service line, if you look carefully, it's absolutely flipped. So there's one population or subpopulation, I should say, of kids, but there are multiple diseases we have to sort of uh, uh, support and provide. So as you can see, it's, it's quite the opposite, the children's care service line. So if you were to use this model to create this particular service line, you're likely to fail because of the fundamental difference in how we sort of 
uh, approach of children's care service line, which I would argue that it's more patient, child patient, family centric, as opposed to provider centric. And if you look at our, uh, our, our business, so you know that patients come to the health system at the most vulnerable. And this is our legacy model that we are currently in, including the one we are right now in, right? So that is a traditional model, which is, I believe, it's a care input space model, very provider centered, as I mentioned, division department and institute centers. We need to move towards this particular care output models, which are patient centered. We are looking at outcomes, satisfaction, centeredness, cost per patient, bundled payment per care cycles. And this goes from the traditional vertical silos, as you see here, to a, a horizontal integration across all different divisions and departments. And we have just embarked on this and we are launching this. It took me about nine months or so to create the blueprint of Children's Care Service Line for Penn State Health. And we are hoping that in January, we are gonna formally launch it. Um, so what are the advantages of Service Line? Remember I mentioned this, access, and I'm sure you have the same issue. I really think this is the most challenging um, problem we have currently for all children's hospital right now and yet most important driver of success. And so that is, that's what we are confronted. And let's review a little bit of the touch points that I feel that the patient is on one side, our whole apparatus is on the left side, right? And, and you can very simple-mindedly or in a parsimonious manner sort of use this and think, well, there's a pre-care component to it and there's a post-care component to it, right? I mean, that's very parsimonious. So if you look at this, you know, I'll just salute, uh, I'll enumerate it like four or five of those call centers, are we optimized here? Do we have efficient scheduling? We have a check-in process that is efficient um, and facile. And how is our pre-admit for surgeries? Because we don't keep, uh, we, 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 I've realized in my time as a chair that, that this is something that was really lagging behind. It's not given as much attention to other things. But then we completely forget and are agnostic sometimes or oblivious of the post-care components, the post-acute care components. That when the child is discharged, we are done, we are happy. What about the transportation, home health devices, pharmacy, 24 seven phone numbers? Do we have all the contact that's required? So it's all sort of under uh, the, you know, the umbrella term access. The other thing that is critical for us, as you know, we see this all the time, right? We are here because we really are in innovation. We have to innovate. Um, so why is this so important? And, and, and research is not just simply an esoteric entity. And when you go to the corporate uh, C-suite folks, they don't understand the language of research, obviously, with all due respect to people there, because now I am on both sides and I understand what it is. But I think it's incumbent upon us to explain what a research is. And as an oncologist, I believe that research is one that bridges the theoretical best, right? It could be 100% cure for Pete's cancer um, uh, for Linda's division, right? But, but that is not possible. You can't have 100% cure rates so what is the actual best? It could be anywhere from 20% to 80% to 90%, depending upon the disease and the state and, and, and the metastatic state and so on. So I really think that we should view research as a construct um, that helps us bridge and comes, makes us, uh, brings us closer to the 100%. So research should be viewed as a business model. And this is how I propose research to all our CEOs. Uh, otherwise it does not resonate with them. And I tell them how we are going to integrate research into clinics and education. It cannot be something existing in a different silo with a different vice chair, different everything. It has to be one fully integrated, happening in real time as the physicians are seeing patients in the clinic. And why is that important? Because it attracts new patients. Obviously with innovation comes new therapies. And because of that, you improve outcomes. And the outcomes that I'm talking about are true, true outcomes. And it's outcomes that drive reputation and reputation expands market share. I cannot see of any other vectorial directionality to this particular endpoint. It is only through this mechanism that we can expand our market share. But it also attracts and retain talent and growth and expansion of the trainees. The pipeline is so important for us to maintain because we are all struggling, uh, filling up faculty positions wherever we are. And the best way to do it is to really invest in our trainees. The true north, as you all know, is quality and safety. We are getting there. If you're not looking at quality and safety, we are really two steps behind, right? So what is important to understand, and we talk, we throw this word quality and safety, we throw the word value, 
But value, as I've said three times now, that it's really the truly the patient outcomes, not just at length of stay, ED revisits. Those are important, it's a true outcome. And as you're talking about true outcome, you also want to remain fo focused on the dollars spent. How are you getting to that point? How many dollars you're spending? What money is going in? What is the expense? And I always try to caution our um, corporate office that decreasing cost, because this is something you'll get all the time in your role as a chair or a dean or what have you, that let's decrease cost. Yeah, decreasing cost at the expense of quality is a flawed idea. But equally important is the second line that I state here, improving access to inferior quality care is equally flawed idea. So we can get there. And lean doesn't mean cutting costs and corners. It's just becoming more efficient in achieving the quality of care and access to superior quality of care. And the performance indicators are critical as we are looking at our careers and our institutions, right? And they have to be actionable. And I want to bring, come back to the R loops and how this became actionable for us. So remember this uh, 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 microaggression from this guy, still single, always naked, remember this R loops? So what we did was something very interesting that we took normal donors and there is a reagent that identifies R loops. And you can see the R loops here in, 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 in green. And the gamma H2X is a marker of DNA damage. So if there's genomic instability, there'll be more of this guy here. This is a normal donor, you and I. If you look at the patient that has the maximum score, the highest score, that particular patient either has autoimmunity and this particular patient had cancer. In the peripheral blood of that, had, if, if you see his, this person's cell, it's his because of x linked recessive disorder, is inundated with R loops and it is inundated with gamma H2X because R loops are processed by clipping it. Uh, so R loops are clipped. So the DNA has all these sort of deletions. So there's significant genomic instability. So this was really intriguing that we could actually look under the microscope and make a distinction. But if you look at another WAS patient who had the lowest score, had just X-linked thrombocytopenia, XLT, and did not have cancer, this, the, the peripheral blood looked very much like normal. So we may, we may have sort of identified a diagnostic or prognostic biomarker, uh, which is also a therapeutic actionable target because we now have a way to bust the R loops by putting one of the enzymes into these cells, um, sort of gene therapy, and, and, and putting it back. And we have shown in another paper in blood that you can re revert the process uh, back to normalcy from here just by simply uh, busting the R loops. So, so the point is here that it's so important to have very clear performance indicators, be it in science or in clinical medicine. The last few slides I wanna share with you are very provocative, very interesting in my mind. So some of you must have uh, uh, seen the particle, this you can see, but it says particle ent entanglement in, in cosmological space. And in quantum physics, entanglement describes a state in which two particles at two ends of the universe, mind you two ends when I say, I'm talking about 10 billion years away or even few million or billion years away, two particles so far away are connected in such a way that measuring the quality of one, it's called a variable, immediately causes the other to adopt a corresponding or anti-corresponding value. Think about it, it's just mind numbing that something that is happening here, one particle can have an influence about 500 million light years away, instantaneously, as if something was connected, right? So this observation was made by Einstein uh, in the 20s and 30s. And he at that time believed that there was some local hidden variable. There was something that was connecting it. Absolutely, think about it, if it was something that was connecting it, it was moving at the speed much, much, much faster than light and nothing can move faster than light. That's what Einstein said. So the Nobel prize was uh, recently given in 2023 because it conclusively proved that Einstein was wrong, that, that local hidden variables don't exist. And then he was wrong in that sense, but he was right that nothing goes faster than the speed of light, but still we don't know what it is connecting it. So, so nature is inherently non-local, I would argue. Cell signaling outcomes have shown and other things are really inherently non-local. And as I mentioned to you, by creating a service line, the clin successful clinical care models have by definition or by necessity, a non-local non state. So let me give you one example of something that I found uh, between uh, this WASP and uh, Fanconi anemia entanglement in nuclear space. 
So this was the idea I had uh, when I was in a cruise ship. I was getting quite bored. Um, and I said, when I was looking at this data and the Nobel Prize and so on, so I said, what if uh, WASP and Fanconi? And so I looked at you, you, some of you know, the Fanconi anemia is a cancer predisposition syndrome, genomic instability, so is Viscadalvis syndrome. So uh, what are they doing? Are they very similar? Are there inputs from FA and the WASP towards creating a stable genome? Is there this kind of an entanglement in the nuclear space? So I looked around in the, in the PubMed literature, there was none, there was not one paper talking about it. This is for some of you who may not be following Fanconi, but this is a very important uh, complex here. And generally the ID2 complex gets ubiquitinated and that is, a, that is a platform for creating DNA repair. So this is just called the PLA, uh, it's called the proximity ligation assay. All you need to know is when these two proteins, uh, WASP and F Fanconi come together, they actually light up, they create this little dots. So what we showed is that it does create dots, which is shown here. So WASP is now part of this complex. This is, this is brand new work, just about a few weeks or a few months old, a few months old, I wanna say. And we are very intrigued by the fact that WASP collaborates with um, this, this protein back, oh, okay, yeah. Um, and, and, and is involved some way uh, in. And so if you look at the stars in the earliest stars, hydrogen helium sort of form along with metals to form very stable stars. But the earliest stars didn't have any helium in it, it was all hydrogen. And they were really evanescent, short-lived. So I think the collaborative entanglement must be the theme. Just quickly to show you some of the new data that we showed that uh, in the absence of WASP, uh, the ubiquitination is, is gone, as you can see here. And this is a critical post-translation modification. We got excited by this and wrote a R01 and just submitted it. Uh, if you look at this part, this is what is vexing us, right? Are we all sort of in the throes of our view, volume versus value, activity versus accomplishments, and the disconnect between the altruistic reason for becoming a doctor versus the business reality of practicing medicine. This is the gap that is really the source of a major contributor of disillusionment and burnout. And, and so, you know, our approach has not been very good. It's much keen to the canary in the coal mine. We just bring this bird out, we wash it with dough, put it right back in, and all our residents and fellows are sort of still undergoing so much of stress. And we, we have to remind ourselves that, you know, you, I'm sure some of you already know of the Stanford duck. The duck is flying very serenely in water, but if you see underneath, uh, there is a tremendous amount of activity. So, so be careful that don't view performance as identity. And some of them, some of our fellows or our colleagues are performing so well, but they're just breaking inside and you don't know that. So remember, remember the Stanford duck as leaders. The last thing I wanna talk about is the dark matter. And some of you know that normal matter, that the visible matter is only about 5% in, in cosmos, but the rest is all dark matter. And one of the first discoveries that was published in one of the nature journals uh, was the, the concept that neutrinos might be, may solve the mystery to dark matter. And neutrinos are basically something that just moves around us. If you look at, we are sitting right here, right in this room, 100 trillion neutrinos pass through our body every second. They're just going through us, just goes through us throughout the, Cosmos. So, so when we don't even know, it's very difficult to detect. And I would ask you, what else do you know is difficult to detect in our health system is the ideological bias. And that results in ideological corruption. And in my mind, like neutrinos, it's really permeating our biospheres where we live in. And, and busting this can lead the way to success. But if you succumb to this, it will lead to further darkness. And one construct to get us to where we want to is the diversity, equity, inclusion. And I think you, you, you all know that if you look at this paper, it was a really provocative paper. I don't know if you have uh, followed it, but it's a paper that showed that 9 million publications that looked at it. And if there was uh, a diversity of authors, um, then the impact of that paper was much higher than if the authors were uh, very homogenous, whatever they, their race was. Similarly, they looked about 6 million scientists and their careers that if they were sort of surrounding themselves uh, around people with different diverse cultures and diverse background coming from all around the world, then they had a much better uh, career success trajectory compared to the ones who are not. So, so I think this is so important to understand. And the other thing that I've faced in the last 10 years in my lead, number of leadership roles is I'm always trying to put off fires uh, in my office, but there's unprofessional behavior. And I think that's so important that we inculcate the, the civility that is required. I urge you to take a look at this paper 
uh, that was published in HBR, The Price of Incivility. It's really provocative how incivility has permeated healthcare so much that it is really harming us. So I hope I've shown you in the concluding slides that in the cell fluctuations, you know, change, whether it's uh, mechanical, metabolic signaling, underlie cellular fitness. In the clinic, I hope I made a case for restructuring and reorganizational fluctuations key to competitive clinical care delivery apparatus. And finally, as I've shown that the quantum mechanical fluctuation, this is actually what's continuously going on is a fine fluctuation in oscillations that are continuously going on in the cosmos. We really, as children's hospitals and children's care, have a bright future ahead. But I think this is so important and humbling. Mark Twain said, it, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. So have the humility to, to accept the things um, to view the things in a different way. With that, thank you very much and happy holidays to all.